Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Stephen Fee, and I'm with the literary and free expression group PEN America. Uh, today, we're discussing our latest report, the Freedom to Write Index 2020. Uh, this is an annual report that we put out. It's a survey of the writers, scholars, and public intellectuals detained over the past year. Uh, and just a quick headline, in 2020, we found that at least 273 writers, academics, and public intellectuals in 35 countries were in prison or otherwise unjustly detained in connection with their writing, their work, or their related activism. Overall, the number of imprisoned writers globally ticked up 9% year over year, obviously representing a major threat to free expression. To discuss all of this, I am joined by a very distinguished panel today. Uh, Karen deutsch Karlekar is the lead author of PEN America's Freedom to Write Index. She's also director of Free Expression at Risk programs at PEN America. Bahram Sintash is son of Uyghur poet and journalist Korban Mahmoud, detained in the Xinjiang province of China. Volha Kalatskaya is a Belarusian writer and translator. She was detained earlier this year in Belarus following her support of peaceful protests. And Atish Tasir is a journalist and author. In 2019, India revoked his overseas citizenship status following a critical Time Magazine story he wrote about India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Thank you to all of you for joining us. Just a reminder to our audience, please feel free to use the Q&A function if you have questions for our panelists. Uh, those will go straight to us and we'll have an opportunity to put some of your questions to our distinguished panelists at the end of our program today. So with that, I'd like to start with uh, Karin deutsch Karlekar at PEN America. Um, you know, you, you put this report together along with our colleagues at the organization. We saw an overall rise uh, in the number of imprisoned writers over the last year. Who are the worst offenders? Um, well, thank you, Stephen. And firstly, I'd like to extend our deep thanks to the John Templeton Foundation for its general support of the Freedom to Write Index and the Writers at Risk database, as well as our gratitude to Penn International and the entire Penn Network for their extensive casework and collaboration on this project. And of course, I'd like to thank other members of the team at Penn America who helped produce this report, including most importantly, Veronica Tien, but also James Tager, Marta Lasota, Polina Sadovskaya, and Summer Lopez. So as you noted, um, we have a total count of 273 writers. Um, with the 2020 index, um, this included 182 writers who were counted last year, um, but nearly a third of those behind bars um, in 2020 were newly detained. Um, the, the worst offenders unsurprisingly remain the same. Um, so the top three countries on our, on our top 10 list, um, China, Saudi Arabia, and Turkey, between them held roughly half of the total number of writers behind bars. I'll go into a little bit more detail on these um, top three. So in China, the total increased to 81 writers, and this is far more than any other country, um, primarily due to the arrests of writers and commentators who critiqued their government's response to COVID and other policies, as well as new information coming to light about detentions in the Xinjiang region, which we'll hear more about from Bahram um, shortly, but where authorities are continuing to carry out a severe crackdown against the Uyghur ethnic minority. And it remains incredibly difficult to get accurate news from Xinjiang because it's essentially an information black hole due to the level of Chinese state repression. In Saudi Arabia, um, actually the number of writers in um, behind bars decreased slightly last year because of releases outnumbered arrests in 2020. However, um, this might look promising on the surface, but I'd like to point out that all of the dissident writers and intellectuals that were released from prison um, people such as Hatun al-Fasi or Aman al-Nafjan continue to face stringent conditions that prevent them from returning to their writing or professional life. And many are also facing legal charges or ongoing trials. So they cannot be considered to be fully free and their voices, voices are still suppressed. Similarly, the environment for free expression in Turkey remains extremely challenging. Um, new laws have narrowed the space for dissent and public intellectuals such as Osman Kavala, a ph philanthropist and advocate for cross-cultural dialogue was slapped with multiple politically motivated criminal charges simply to keep him in jail. And this was mere hours after he had been released on appeal when another sentence was overturned. We also saw the number of writers behind bars increase in Iran, Egypt, and Vietnam. And I'll highlight particularly in Iran, we saw a notable trend of a deepening crackdown on members of a professional writers organization called the Iranian Writers Association, which had been targeted in the past 
due to their insistence on upholding um, the right to free expression and where we saw a number of members and um, even the secretary, um, Arash Ganji, put in jail this past year. And Karin, you staying with you, you know, you and your colleagues spent months poring over this data. And you, you mentioned briefly a bit about COVID. And I'm wondering what are the major trends that you picked up on this year uh, that are really fueling this rise in crackdown against writers and public intellectuals? Well, definitely, I think, yeah, as you pointed out on a global level, the COVID-19 pandemic, I would say, worsened existing situations for free expressions in many countries. And it caused, not, it's, you know, it was obviously a public health crisis, but it further exacerbated pressures on human rights and democracy worldwide. Um, so governments have been using the pandemic as an opportunity to further restrict people's speech. And we saw a number of individuals who had raised their voices to critique their government's handling of the pandemic. They were targeted, they were imprisoned um, via existing laws or through new um, COVID specific laws. And a few examples that come to mind um, in Uganda, the novelist Kakwenza Rukira Bashaija was detained and tortured and under charges purportedly related to COVID-19, but which actually appear to have been motivated by the authorities' displeasure over his fictional novel, which was viewed as being critical of President Yoweri Museveni. Similarly, in Bangladesh, um, Mushtaq Ahmed, who is a writer and political commentator, was detained under the, the Digital Security Act in May 2020 for his writing online. Um, about the government's handling of the COVID pandemic. He, um, after several appeals, which were unsuccessful, he, I mean, very tragically, he basically passed away while in detention early in 2021 um, in what was av an avoidable death. So those are some of the specific examples this year. Um, turning to sort of a very country specific ex example, but which really um, sort of drove one, you know, a big part of the new cases we saw this year. And we'll hear about it in much more depth in a minute, but Belarus, um, after the political crisis that started in August, um, you know, led to a detention of a large number of writers. So Belarus had accounted for zero cases actually in last year's index and has now catapulted into our top five. And that's pretty extraordinary. I mean, it's 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 one of the only countries to crack the top 10 this year. Are there other countries where you're, you're concerned, other individual cases other than the ones that you've just mentioned? Well, I would say in terms of cases, um, you know, many, many of these individual stories stand out and it's always shocking, although you know, in some countries, not a surprise often to read that someone has been accused of a crime or put into jail for writing or, or simply sharing their opinion. And this is especially true most of the cases we've seen. You know, it's people who are writing about ways their government can be better or who are identifying serious problems with the status quo in society or who are advocating for basic human rights. And, and many are accused of being traitors or terrorists as a result. I mean, one case we focused on a lot in the past year is Xu Jiang, who is a Chinese essayist and legal scholar. He's written extensively about government mismanagement, human rights issues, um, different civil rights issues such as migrant workers, corruption issues. Um, and he basically has been charged with subversion of state power and now faces a potential sentence of life in prison. Um, not only has he been detained for over a year, but his partner, who's a, fe a feminist activist in her own light, Li Chao Xu, has been detained simply because she's called for her partner's release. Um, in terms of the countries that, you know, of, of particular concern, I know we'll go to go into a few in, a, in more depth in a minute. I would say on a humanitarian level, I mean, the, the potential threat to political prisoners in countries experiencing surges in coronavirus is of great concern to us. And we've seen over the past year, you know, several of the cases of people counted in our index, um, you know, did actually contract COVID-19 while jailed in very poor conditions. Um, and this included people like Barbara Rao in India. Um, in Iran, we had Nargis Mohammadi, Nazreen Sotodeh, and just in the last month, Bakhtash Abtin. Um, and Penn, you know, joined by a number of partners and other human rights organizations, continues to urge government authorities to release political prisoners, even on a temporary furlough um, on health grounds as needed. And then I would say looking forward into early 2021, Myanmar is obviously a huge concern. In the 2020 index, Myanmar was already in our top 10, which signaled that even pre-coup, the country had been a fairly restrictive environment for writers and free expression. Um, however, since the 2021 coup in, in February, we've seen poets killed in protests, the targeted arrests of writers and creative artists, including notably um, a prominent satirical comedian named Zarganar. So I fully expect Myanmar to actually the, be the Belarus of 2021 and, and sort of maybe even jump in to our top five next year. So that's sort of looking looking forward a little bit. 
Well, Karn, thank you for laying out the, the roadmap for us for this conversation. I, I want to turn to our panelists, and Karn, we're going to bring you back in, I think, to help us fill some of this out. But I'd really like to start with uh, Bahram Sintash. Um, you know, Karin obviously mentioned the situation in China, which is among our top three uh, jailers of writers worldwide. Your father, a, a Uyghur writer and poet and scholar, uh, was disappeared some three and a half years ago. Uh, presumably detained. What is the status of his case as of today? Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Pan America, for this important opportunity. Um, just want to uh, a little bit introduce about my father. Uh, my father is 71 years old. Uh, uh, he's a prominent Uyghur intellectual journalist and poet. And my father is a uh, former editor or chief of uh, government control uh, Uyghur magazine, Xinjiang Civilization. He was working for this popular Uyghur magazine for 1985 until he retired as an editor in chief in 2011. He was known for selecting works by the region's most in influential writers, Uyghur culture, um, uh, uh, writers on Uyghur culture and history and social development for publication. The main goal uh, of the Xinjiang Civilization magazine was teaching Uyghurs to understand themselves and educate them about their Uyghur culture and history. And in his role in this, uh, his more than 30 years of professional career as an editor in chief and his ability of uh, a sacrificial keep him as an uh, organizer of the Uyghur uh, thinkers, even after he was retired. Um, his invincible uh, fame made him in the target of China's mass detention of Uyghur and Uyghur intellectuals. Uh, I could not be able to get any information about my father since he was detained, uh, since he was taken away from his uh, home in Urimji in late 2017. I really want, uh, want to know his uh, whereabouts and his well-being. I might not know if he was already uh, died in the detention camp. Uh, in two separate investigation reports, uh, Radio Free Asia uh, corroborated my father's dip, uh, disappearance in 2018 and uh, in 2020, his uh, continued detainment was uh, confirmed we had a phone call to Urimchi through his, uh, my father's uh, former co-worker by Radio Free Asia reporter. So um, uh, my information uh, about my father is very limited. So uh, the days in the last three years, as you mentioned, more than three years, I think about my father 24 seven. And this happens to the all Uyghurs, especially the children of Uyghur intellectuals overseas, we are fighting back to save our parents from Chinese concentration camps. Oh, Bahram, it's such a, a devastating story, and I appreciate you you coming into this conversation. One of the things that you mentioned in your father's writing and in his work in particular is educating people about the culture, the language, the heritage of the Uyghur people. And that seems to be what has perhaps uh, led to his persecution. I wonder what you can say about the influence your father has had throughout his life on Uyghur culture through song lyrics and his poetry. I mean, do you have any particular reminiscences about your father's role in really building a community, particularly in Xinjiang? Yes, my father's uh, more than 40 years career in, uh, in, the, in the writing and then journalist, journalism and then many different area. My, did, my, my father's contribution and work was uh, very, um, very iconic and very important for, to Uyghur culture. Uh, you're right, my, yes, my father uh, isn't only a well-known Uyghur journalist, editor-in-chief, He's also a prominent Uyghur um, poet. My father, uh, many of his uh, poems were published in the journals 
and Uyghur uh, poetry collection books uh, during his day, uh, during his early days of professional career. Some of his famous uh, poems were uh, used as a song lyrics for Uyghur pop music during uh, during the 80s. For example, Block Dicky I Sholisi. This is one of his famous uh, poem. Uh, the, the translation will be uh, the reflection of moon on spring water. And other uh, poem, which is Sakra Kazi, uh, the translation will be country girl, or the most famous uh, poems uh, of my father, which were used as a lyricist of uh, Uyghur pop songs in nineteen uh, in in eighty. Well, I want to quick, I want to stay with you, Bahram, but briefly, Karin, I know that, and one of the things that Bahram is, is talking about here is, you know, the fact that his father has been targeted for, you know, uh, uh, or believed to be targeted for the promotion of Uyghur culture and language and poetry, and obviously such an influential figure. Is that a trend that we're seeing elsewhere in the world? I mean, not just in, in, in Xinjiang, but, but, but across the world in, in the index this year? Yes, definitely. And it's something that we um, first picked up last year and was, I think, for sure, a continuing trend this year as well. We, um, we, were, we, we also were looking in the index at sort of particular reason that, let's say, writers are targeted and, and intellectuals, rather, you know, in addition to sort of journalists and human rights activists and some of the other more obvious categories. And when we look at that, we see that writers and you know, academics, researchers are often particularly being targeted if they are trying to sort of preserve or um, speak out of, you know, preserve linguistic rights, um, speak out about different cultures being under attack or threat. And, you know, their very writing and, and work is also a way of cultural preservation. And in countries that are really trying to crack down on ethnic or religious minority groups, um, you know, so these people are really being targeted. And it's, and it, you know, maybe it's simply because they're writing in a language which the authorities are trying to stamp out. Um, or that they're trying to promote the culture in general. Um, so in, in China, we see this particularly with um, the Uyghur and um, Tibetan ethnic minorities. We also see it in a few countries in the Middle East with the Kurdish minority, particularly Iran and um, Turkey as well. But yes, globally, it is, a, um, it is a bit of a trend as well in terms of targeting people for this particular issue. Yeah, and, and Bahram, just back to you briefly. What do we know generally about the conditions for free expression in Xinjiang? I think that, you know, recently, at least English language press has been covering this more, speaking to more people who have survived these concentration camps, as you say, uh, these efforts at cultural erasure uh, in Xinjiang. What does it look like for someone who's trying to speak out, who's trying to perhaps, you know, uh, do some of what your father did as a writer and poet right now? Yes, um, th at the moment, uh, since after 2017, uh, the Chinese government cracked down on more than 300 Uyghur intellectuals. This is almost all intellectuals of Uyghur of modern days. Um, this crackdown of Uyghur intellectuals is known as an alarming symbol of the Communist Party's most intense social engineering drive in decades. So. Right now, the, 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 the atmosphere of Uyghur um, society without their intellectuals, without their own books, without their any, anything close to let the Uyghurs uh, uh, learn about their own culture, language. So the, except, the, and, and the mostly the government, the propaganda brainwashed them and assimilate them into Han Chinese and agrees China's Communist Party's ideologies I learn 24 seven and medias and books. So the, the previous, previous generation, like my father and other intellectuals, so they have no longer right about Uyghurs. Not only, and their life is is are they are mostly they are in camp and jail, so there's life threatening situations. So, the, we have to save them. What we 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 are talking about how we will write in the future. And this is very optimistic hope, but right now we are thinking about their life. For example, particularly me, I'm look thinking about my father. I hope to see him alive one day. So.
this is a just atmosphere right now in the, in the Uyghur region. And yeah, Stephen, if I could jump in, um, please. Yeah, Karen. for the Uyghur region, I would say it's one of the most dire situations in the world for human rights, free expression, and sort of a, a cultural genocide. Um, the it's so difficult to get information out that I think I mean we we count several dozen cases in the index, but for sure I think it's the tip of the iceberg. You know there there potentially are many more cases that we don't even know about because it's simply impossible to get information or it's too dangerous for people to even get the word out because there's right. there's almost no way to communicate safely. So it's um when we when we look at the numbers I would say it's a snapshot and and I wouldn't want to say that um that it's not it, it does it may not even show the whole picture for Xinjiang because it's just so hard to get information out from that area. Right, thank you. And Bahram, please stay stay with us. I wanna come back to you on a few questions, but I'd like to, to spin the globe a bit. Um, you know, Atish Tasir, um, you know, India ranks uh, as the only democracy in our top 10 list of the world's worst jailers of, of writers. And, you know, I'm wondering just from your vantage point, I know you're here in the US, but where is this crackdown on free expression coming from in India? You know, I think for folks who might be watching, they understand perhaps some of the context that's happening in China and these autonomous regions, but but maybe are surprised to see India come up so high on this list. Yeah, Stephen, we're, we're witnessing a complete remaking of the project of the Indian state, of the idea of India, as, as formulated by people like Gandhi and Nehru, which was this very inclusive idea. And it was like an idea based on, India has all these layers of history. There was British rule, there was Muslim rule, there was a, there's a surviving Hindu past into the present. And the, 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 the sort of project of India was to include all these elements. These were all to be participants in the national project. And since the election of Narendra Modi uh, in 2014 and the coming forward of this Hindu nationalist ideology, it's a remaking of India along lines of a kind of majoritarianism, a sort of, it's very upper caste, it's very Hindu, it's very male. And what, it, what happens really is that it falls afoul Oh, there's suddenly there are all these enemies and 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 they, they describe them as sort of like anti-nationals or they use a phrase called urban naxals and basically whether you're muslim whether you're dalit or lower caste whether you belong to like a liberal marxist persuasion whether you're a woman woman's rights activist all sorts of people who don't fit into this kind of very very strict mold are seen as sort of threats to the BJP's program. And um, they've really kind of, they've sort of weaponized these fault lines and, 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 are, and are really, we're, we're sort of engaged in a kind of culture war on many, many fronts. And so, I mean, I'm hearing from you, Atish, that uh, similar strains, right? I mean, in, in, in Bahram, in, in, in the case of, of Uyghur culture, there's this sort of central effort to erase or set aside the Uyghur culture and language and life. And Atish, I'm hearing similar strains here about things that don't fit into the majoritarian mindset of BJP, the leading party in India, that that's, that's become antithetical to the state. That's become an enemy of the state. Right, but I mean, if there's a sort of added note of lament or tragedy, we're talking about the great experiment in democracy in, in, in basically the, the, the sort of developing world. This is 70 years of uninterrupted democracy, of, well, with, with, except for Mrs. Gandhi's emergency in 1975. This is like a tradition of democracy longer than many Southern European countries. We had thought it had taken very deep root. It was in many ways a kind of light for other parts of Asia to look to. And so to see India falter in this way, there is this kind of, there is, a, you're right, absolutely, there are resonances with what Baram was saying, but there's also, um, it's, it's a kind of a tra tragedy on a, on, a, on a much bigger scale because the expectations and hopes were so high. One of the things that I think is so so troubling, I think this, Karin, you've revealed in this report that PEN America and other PEN centers have revealed, isn't just crackdowns happening within a country, but the long arm of countries and how they crack down on perhaps free expression outside of their own borders. And, and I mentioned, Atish Tassir, in the, in the introduction, your own experience with this, the revocation of your 
overseas citizenship status. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that in, in the wake of your Time Magazine piece. Well, let me just tell you what this thing is. It's basically, India doesn't have dual nationality and this is the only equivalent. It's called an overseas citizenship of India. And um, it was, I, I'm of mixed parentage, half Indian, half Pakistani, but I grew up with my mother in India. And it was very well known that that really that was the country that I sort of belonged to. And this 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 document is not if you have any kind of Pakistani parentage or whatever, you're not meant to have this document. But it was very i would written about my Pakistani heritage or meeting my estranged Pakistani father and all of these things and was very much part of Indian life, lived in India 30 or 40 years. And for instance, right now in this moment of COVID, this would have been my only means to go back and see my 70 year old mother, my 90 year old grandmother. This was, it was a sort of one connection and much of the Indian diaspora kind of depends on this document. And um, suddenly after this cover story, which came out in 2019 on the cover of Time Magazine about the Modi election, and it, it somehow sparked an absolutely like almost unnatural volatile reaction there's a sort of Hindu nationalist troll army that came after me really hard. And, um, and I thought that, okay, it's bad while it's happening, but they kept saying, including the prime minister, they kept saying, this is a Pakistani, which was, which was the part that was worrying me most because I felt that the prime minister was signaling that this person could, should be treated in some ways as, as a kind of um, coming from an enemy nation. And six months later, things rolled around and, uh, and they seized this document and blacklisted me and have basically made it impossible for me to now return to India. And um, I said at the time, I said, you know, what you're seeing is not about the fact that I have a Pakistani father or anything. You're seeing a changing of the, of the rules governing this document, which will have widespread ramifications for the huge Indian diaspora. And sure enough, a few weeks ago, we saw them announce sort of the fresh rules. And now if you're, let's say an American citizen with this OCI and you're doing humanitarian work in India or you're doing the work sort of work that Penn does, or if you're a journalist, you have to receive prior permission from the government or they can seize this document. Mm. And so you're really seeing a kind of like, you're sort of seeing this, they, they're sort of, uh, they're sort of put, turning the screws on the Indian diaspora in a way that will like really kind of design to bring them in line. And, and I think that my case was probably a forerunner of or a sort of foretaste of what was to come. And, and Atish, just sticking with you one, uh, briefly, we're, we're, we've seen uh, in the 2020 index in particular, a number of the writers that were detained were connected to the ongoing uh, Bhima Corrigan case, um, where, where they were accused of inciting intercaste violence at a protest. Um, critics see this as politically motivated attempts to target those who've advocated for minority groups within India. I'm wondering what both these things, these inside outside, um, the crackdown within the diaspora, the crackdown inside of the country, what does this say about the status of free expression in India right now? I mean, it's, 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 it, there's it's almost zero tolerance for dissent now. We're, 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 we're dealing in a climate, there was, an, there was an ad the other day showing almost a kind of cliched sort of Hindu Muslim bonhomie friendship. It was the kind of thing that would pass as a sort of cliche of the old India. And, uh, and the ad had to be withdrawn. People in Bollywood absolutely terrified. A, a comedian, a Muslim comedian the other day was put in jail for a month for, for a joke he hadn't even cracked. And so, I mean, we're, we're talking about like a climate of aware, and you, you know, because it's still maybe not the democracy it used to be, but a democracy after a fashion, it's very, uh, it's very interesting what the approach is. So they'll make kind of examples of one or two or three people as they did with me. And what they want more than anything else is that people fall in line on their own. They start to self-censor, they start to watch themselves. And, and you know, having seen India in these last six years, the change is extraordinary. The judiciary as a check on government all but collapsed. The media completely sort of uh, corralled into sort of becoming a cheerleading club for the government. And so 
all the little avenues of, of all the sort of part of what was a part of the energy and sort of dynamism of Indian democracy, all of it has fallen quiet. And now there are one or two or three portals which still report real news, which are still in a sense, there are a few intellectuals who are still sort of outspoken. But what one used to think of that kind of rambunctious Indian democracy, it, it's all but gone. You know, uh, uh... Karin Dorj Karlekar, you know, it's interesting to hear Atish talk about what's happening to see India as a democracy in this top 10. I'm wondering globally, um, should we see the crackdown on writers and free expression as a, a leading indicator of democratic decline or a lagging indicator or is some combination of the two? Um, good question. Um, definitely, I think crackdowns on expression, the media and activists more broadly. Um, I actually wrote a whole report about this for um, the National Endowment for Democracy, based on a lot of the Freedom House data, which for many years tracked both demo, you know, democratic trends and also um, press freedom trends. And usually it is a lead indicator. Usually what we saw um, over you know, several decades of, of research was that um, the, you know, the press and, and activists were, I would say, the first to be cracked down upon um, when, when there was sort of a move toward an author, you know, authoritarianism or a government that was trying to sort of silence dissent. Um, writers and intellectuals, I think, are another, maybe not in the, in the very front line, but sort of the second front line. So writers and intellectuals often are sort of that second line of, of, of attack in terms of going after these sort of very prominent um, intellectual, cultural, um, you know, influential voices. And they also, because they, because they are from those countries and have, I would say, an, an authenticity, um, you know, they are often sort of a canary in a coal mine in terms of, of you know, a democratic crackdown. I mean, I mean actually with the, with the India example, it's, um, it's no surprise that we've seen these sort of declines in free expression and academic freedom over, I would say, more the past, you know, five or six years. This year, for the first time, Freedom House declined India in its Freedom in the World Index in terms of its status as a democracy. And it was the first time in over 20 years, you know, probably even as Atish says since the emergency that India has not ranked in the free category. So yes, it is it is a lead indicator. And I think, you know, for many countries we see that these these trends um, then lead to much broader crackdown. So as Atish said, and in other countries, you see the judiciary, you see, you know, the ability of the legislature to, to act as a check on the on government. Um, you, see, you see broader sort of democratic declines as well across the board. Um, so that is for sure the case. Um, also just picking up on another of the points that you raised even in terms of sort of the diaspora and you know crackdowns in countries not just affecting writers within a country but also you know writers maybe who are um, you know their ethnic origin is from that country originally but live abroad I'd also like to highlight for example Iran which is going after a huge mm -hmm. number of dual nationals and um, writers intellectuals um, journalists of Iranian origin but who you know often are living in the diaspora. And Iran basically um, is, an you know, they, they, if they go back to Iran for research or to visit their family, many times they're detained and are now essentially being kept as hostages by the Iranian government. Um, so that's been, a, I, I think, a very worrisome trend in the last few years with Iran, which has a, a large number of dual nationals behind bars. Um, China similarly has has imprisoned a few writers of, of dual, dual nationality. Um, so there was an Australian Chinese academic who was detained in China. So that is that is also, I would, I would say, a a global tactic as well in, in a number of repressive countries, but also countries like India. Right, right. And I just want to remind our audience, we're seeing some great questions coming in in the q and I'm seeing them. I promise we will definitely get to as many as we possibly can. So thank you all. I encourage you to use it. Atish, I'll come back to you, but I'd, I'd love to quickly turn to uh, Volha Kalatskaya, uh, joining us from Minsk um, right now. I, I think, look, on behalf of us, at least at PEN America, we've all been just overwhelmed and, and, and inspired by the protest movement that has dominated Belarus since these you know, sham elections last summer. Um, so I wonder if you can tell us a bit about the role in particular that translators like yourself, writers, poets, artists, and cultural figures are playing in this movement. Um, well, uh, you know, um, uh, if we speak about the role of uh, writers and uh, intellectuals, um, I would... Uh, 
um, uh, say that uh, in the early enthusiastic stage of protests, poets, writers, musicians, actors inspired the people uh, who took to the streets. They put our uh, shared sentiments into words. They, um, well, um, sang songs, they created powerful images, bringing us together and uh, liberating a lot of Belarusians from fear which uh, basically haunted uh, many of us for years. Uh, then later came a, a more uh, pessimistic stage, uh, which saw repression strengthening on an unprecedented scale when fear of arrest and criminal prosecution was looming large. And uh, um, uh, well, uh, poets, writers, uh, saints, song um, writers, um, uh, and uh, other people involved in cultural movements uh, appeared in uh, different neighborhood performances. Um, they um, uh, kind of um, helped us um, stay calm and stay, and uh, carry on in spite of uh, the strengthening repression, in spite of uh, uh, the fear of being persecuted, being arrested and thrown into jail. Um, and uh, um, I do hope that uh, at present stage, which I would call a kind of analytical stage, um, uh, which we still have to go through, um, well, uh, literary figures will hold a mirror to us all uh, so that we can um, uh, see what went wrong and why Lukashenko um, uh, somehow managed uh, to avoid ousting, even though uh, he had lost virtually all public support. Well, and, and Volha, I mean, I know you as a translator, especially, I, I, the work of translation, for those who aren't in the Penn International uh, sort of family here, um, you know, plays such an important role in our work because, you know, part of our charter is this breaking of boundaries, this breaking of barriers yeah. and borders. You've translated Margaret Atwood, you've translated Virginia Woolf, you've translated Tennessee Williams. You know, how do you think translators like yourself are helping us perhaps outside of Belarus better understand the cultural context and the political context of what's happening there? <laughs> well, um, you already have the answer in your question. <laughs> uh, translators um, do work like a bridge between different cultures, and uh, uh, if uh, there were no translators to um, uh, to share uh, with um, people. Um, uh, overseas or uh, people elsewhere, uh, well, uh, our perspective, um, probably hardly anyone uh, would know what's, uh, uh, what was going on. And uh, um, uh, I would also uh, like uh, to say a couple of words about, um, uh, well, uh, a kind of new genre uh, emerging in um, uh, present uh, Belarus. Um, uh, you know, uh, in my, well, final um, uh, address to the court in uh, in a closing argument, um, I quoted um, a chapter from uh, uh, the Penelope by uh, Margaret Atwood. If you uh, let me quote it now, um, we had no voice, we had no name, we had no choice, we had one face, one face the same. We took the blame. It was not fair. But now we're here, and we are all here too, the same as you, and so on. Um, so uh, my colleague, my co-translator, poet, and um, literary critic, Maria Martisevich, was the first to notice that uh, a closing argument has been reinvented in Belarus as a new literary genre. Um, and um, I, I would really like to hope that it's not a long-term development, but uh, judging from the present state of things, uh, we are going to listen to uh, many more works um, in this uh, genre. 
and uh, um, well, um, uh, I, I really hope that uh, Belarusian writers uh, will rise to the challenge of uh, creating both non-fiction and uh, uh, novels and poetry to explore the events of 2020 and uh, 2021 in Belarus. I uh, do hope to see uh, some intriguing plots unfold, and uh, um, I do hope to see uh, complicated multidimensional characters reveal their true nature. It seems to me that uh, such works uh, may gain uh, wide international readership, and with the help of translators, um, uh, these works uh, will give people uh, of different cultures a perspective of um, um, what uh, we uh, have been living through. You'll have to excuse our, our dog here who is trying to interrupt you. Um, but what a what he a, was supporting me. It was yes, it was it was it was it was, it was, it was, it was affirmation. Um, I, I'm wondering. I mean, you all just heard the, what what Volha Koletskaya just said. Uh, the the closing statement as a new literary genre. I mean, there's something so beautiful, but also something so heartbreaking about that. I mean, Karin, just to, uh, and and please, Volha, if you have more to say on that. Um, but but Karin, I mean, I, to see now Belarus enter the top ten, right? To go from zero to so many cases this year, you know, what does that tell you about, I mean, this very notion of, of, of writers, uh, as you said before, being on the front lines of, of these really dramatic political upheavals that we see? I mean, I think it shows the power that writers have in, in sort of, you know, leading, inspiring, um, serving as this sort of authentic voice of, of what the people want in different countries. Um, so it, it does sh sort of show the really key role that writers have played in, in protests around the world. And actually, I mean, Belarus, I think, is obviously the most dramatic example from this year, but we, we saw this in a number, number of other countries as well. Um, I'd point to Cuba, um, where a number of, of writers and artists have been detained um, in the past year as well, who are sort of pushing back against government repression. And also in um, Thailand, where we saw a number of writers um, taking part in the protests. So the, the key role of writers, I think, is very important. I think the other thing that it really points to, though, is, um, you know, that, um, and this is something that Atish alluded to, is that, um, you know, democratic gains or, 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 you know, a democratic or open environment can't be taken for granted. And a situation in a country can really change very, very quickly, um, you know, overnight. And, and you really see, you can see dramatic changes in a situation. So it's not, I don't, I don't think these, these freedoms are something that can be taken for granted. I mean, Belarus was already, you know, a very, very repressive political environment, but we've seen sort of backsliding and free expression globally in a number of very open environments, um, including India, including Hungary and Poland and Eastern Europe. Up. We've even seen, I would say, backsliding in the U.S. and then, you know, in other Western democracies as well. So I, I do think it, it shows the, you know, the, the the ways things can change very quickly, but also sort of the key roles of writers being on the front lines um, in, in in terms of protests, but also in, in terms of sort of pushing large, larger changes in in governance and in countries around the world. And I should say, Volha Kaletskaya, I mean, you yourself were detained um, in this protest movement. I mean. What does that say about the room for free expression in Belarus when, when you know, I mean, obviously you've been taking part in peaceful demonstrations, but that by training you are indeed a writer, you're a, you're, you're a cultural leader. What does that say about free expression that you, you became a target yourself? Uh, well, um, uh, it's just obvious that uh, the uh, space for free expression, um, the space for uh, free, uh, free thought is uh, shrinking rapidly in, in Belarus. Um, and uh, the crackdown uh, has extended uh, far beyond the election period and um, it is still gaining momentum. Uh, well, um, to give just a few example, uh, political analyst, literary critic, and uh, historian of literature Alexander Fedulta, who belongs to Pen Belarus, is facing absurd charges, absolutely absurd charges of uh, allegedly attempting to assassinate Lukashenko and plotting a coup with a few other individuals who are now kept in the notorious uh, KGB prison in Minsk. Um, political activist and writer uh, Pavel Severinets um, has been jailed for over a year. Uh, so um, one of our uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, one of our um, brilliant political analysts uh, defined the Lukashenko regime as preemptive uh, authoritarianism, which uh, destroys um, all potential challenges before they can really pose um, a threat to the regime. So um, the space for free expression is shrinking. Um, uh, and uh, the government uh, is really willing to, to trample on everything that moves. Uh, for example, the most influential online media uh, portal, um, Tudbai, has lost its media status, uh, which means that uh, reporters cannot safely cover mass gatherings and face plenty of other restrictions. Um, Non-pro-governmental periodicals are being closed down and uh, have run into a number of serious difficulties. Um, so uh, bloggers are persecuted on a routine basis. All Belarusian crowdfunding platforms, which allowed cultural figures to raise money for publishing books and other cultural activities, have been destroyed. Independent publishers and booksellers have had their bank accounts arrested. Um, so. Um, now we are expecting uh, Lukashenko's decree that is likely to place further restrictions on, for, on civil society and uh, non-progovernmental NGOs. Um, so um, our illegitimate leader has um, uh, recently announced that uh, he is keen to ensure the system of government that he has created is sustained even after the end of his era. Um, but uh, even if the regime uh, succeeds in stifling, um, well, uh, free expression, in stifling all dissenting voices, it just cannot stop us from thinking. Even in prison, even um, under uh, the harshest conditions, you are free to think. No one can take that away for, uh, from you. No one can... Um, change your mindset. No one um, can uh, tell you what you uh, have to think. No one can steal that from you. It's so powerful and, and I think <laughs> resonates for all of us, uh, both on this panel and for the audience. I, I want to turn to some of our audience questions uh, at this point. And, and, and Bahram Sintash, to you first. First, I got we did get a question about if your father's works are being published in English. And I'll add to that question. Um, you, you heard Volha Kaletskaya talk about how writers, uh, poets, uh, you know, fiction, nonfiction writers are providing this sort of spiritual or, or you know, sort of uh, larger uh, uh, inspiration to these movements. I'm wondering how you, in your work in disseminating your father's work and disseminating the work of other Uyghur cultural figures, also see that, uh, you know, literature is playing a role in inspiring people to make change? Um, in the Uyghur region, um, I heard met the testimonies of uh, artists and and uh, what I forgot about her name, pronunciation, I'm sorry that. Um, it's, it, it's, it, um, when it comes to Uyghur region, Uyghurs are now is the com China committing genocide uh, against Uyghurs. So almost all Uyghur did, uh, intellectuals are in a camp uh, or being detained or some of them already passed, uh, died, killed in the camp. So the, 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 when it comes to government to control a group, they, uh, they detain the, those intellectuals first, then overcome and control the rest of the population of uh, any ethnic groups. So Uyghur intellectuals were the first target for the Chinese government. So uh, the, some Uyghurs overseas, uh, like me and uh, other uh, Uyghur scholars and intellectuals, being the voice of uh, voices uh, Uyghurs, and also continuing the the way our uh, intellectuals in the Uyghur region, the we are promoting Uyghur culture and also teaching Uyghur culture to our uh, new generation and overseas. So also uh, we want to um, uh, promoting Uyghur culture to, to the wider audience in the internationally to teach who we are, uh, what type of uh, 
great uh, works our intellectuals has been uh, work and uh, what type of books we have been published. So we want to, to um, promote this part to the to the international uh, audiences. So uh, when it comes to the questions, uh, um, so for example, the, my previous work uh, about the demolishing of Uyghur, uh, the mosque and cemeteries and other shrines and other religious sites. So this report exposes the uh, real situations of the Uyghurs right now. So this, this uh, Chinese government's uh, crackdown on Uyghurs, not only crackdown on the uh, Uyghur identity and the Uyghur scholars and the Uyghur population, this is also a crackdown on Uyghur, uh, the religion in the Uyghur region. So uh, we, want to, um, we want to expose more information to the world and then hope um, the, eventually we, uh, we, we will uh, save our culture and then continue our culture. One day we, we, we will have a, a right to write. We have right to uh, express our, uh, uh, our uh, thoughts in the Uyghur region. We want, we want to save this culture. Yeah. Thank you. And, and yes, your, your father's works are available in English? Or are any of them available in English? I forgot to answer that. And, okay. and not, not most, uh, um, you know, uh, it's not available in English, but mm -hmm. I, I, but I, uh, I am saving all digital copies of uh, Xinjiang Civilization journals uh, in the past 30 years. I, 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 I want, I, I publish it on, on, on my personal website called Uyghurism.com. And, and also other Uyghurs, Overseas are compiling and saving all the digital versions of Uyghur books. Uh, there are many, thousands of ten, tens of thousands of books are um, successfully saved on, on the digital world, digital uh, world, like on the internet and other sources. So we luckily we we, we would translate more uh, great novel. Uh, uh, genres and novel works uh, published by Uyghurs into English and other languages in, in one day. That's great. Well, uh, Atish, I want to turn to you, Atish Tasir. I mean, a you, you, couple questions I'm going to try to combine for you. Um, one, one person asks, um, as they listen to your description of India today, it felt like looking in a mirror, the U.S. seems to be undergoing a similar democratic trajectory and wanting to know if you agree with that. Another interesting question for you, um, you know, are we grading India on a curve, uh, you know, to, to see it be a, one of the only democracies in the top 10, the fact that it's making into the top 10 against other countries rated as not free or less democratic, should we be even more alarmed that that's happening in the world's largest democracy? You don't have to answer both questions, but I figured I'd throw them both um, at you. Yeah, a couple of things. Uh, on the first point, uh, yes, you know, democracy including in in the western world has faced been under threat there's been that kind of assault that kind of leader but being in america and seeing the press rally seeing the judiciary rally seeing an opposition rise up and and defeat an ideology and these things which are so important to the sort of containment of of, of this trend well, that that hasn't happened in India. It's it's been it's been a walkover. All everything that one hoped would be points of resistance hasn't really been able to sustain this onslaught. And I think that 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 difference is everything because that's the difference between being able to have institutions that one can depend on versus versus really having a, a far more fragile democracy than one ever imagined. Um, as to your second point, um, well, it's very interesting. This, you know, I was I was in a um, in a group of Indian intellectuals a, a little while ago, and somebody said, you know, the thing with India is that it'll slide and slide and slide, and we'll still be saying, oh, here's the largest democracy in the world, and you know, and 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 I think that that's something that 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 one really has to focus on, especially vis-a-vis -vis the American government, because they want to use India strategically and it's not necessarily in their interest to um, to speak to India in fairly severe strict ways 
about things that they know, a kind of climate of, of freedom deteriorating. And, and, and I, it, for me, that's very worrying because it gives the Indian government a lot of validation. And it makes a very perilous mistake because the American friendship with India works if there are values in common, if there are merely shared interests, then you end up in a situation as you did very quickly with Turkey or with Pakistan, where you know it's not really a meaningful friendship. And I think that, that, that it's very, very hard to move America's, uh, this new government even, just to sort of to, to, to speak seriously to India about, about, about how sudden and severe the slide has been. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Volha Kaletskaya, uh, you know, uh, someone in the chat mentioned uh, that they are, you know, witnessing uh, some of your comments uh, through the lens of what they experienced in the Russian Federation and mentioned the relationship between yeah. Vladimir Putin and Alexander Lukashenko. I wonder if you can speak at all, and, and, and others too, Karin, as well, if, if, if not, but if you can speak at all about how the crackdown that we're seeing in Belarus might be enabled by or, or, or have a similar design to things that happen in other countries. What, what impact is what happens in Russia, a very close ally to the Lukashenko government? What, is that, what impact does that have on what's happening in Belarus right now? Um, well, uh, um, historically, uh, we have had quite um, close ties with Russia, and uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, the um, uh, Putin regime in Russia now and the Lukashenko regime are just like uh, twin brothers. Mm. They <laughs> they may have very um, tense personal relations, but uh, they're just twins. And um, uh, when it comes to important issues like the stability of uh, the systems that they have established. Uh, they um, have no other choice but to uh, support each other. Uh, and um, uh, we uh, do see this um, uh, support uh, for the Lukashenko regime uh, from Russia um, uh, at the time when um, Lukashenko is experiencing uh, quite uh, serious challenges. Uh, Russia uh, remains uh, its uh, chief donor, so to say, chief first sponsor who continues mm -hmm. to subsidize um, uh, Belarusian economy. And uh, um, more importantly, uh, Lukashenko's uh, regime, uh, Russia still continues um, uh, and strengthens um, the ties between um, uh, the so-called law enforcement. I, I don't think uh, these uh, institutions have uh, much to do with uh, uh, real law in, in the normal meaning of the word, um, but um, uh, these uh, institutions uh, in Russia and Belarus are uh, cooperating closely. And um, unfortunately, uh, we have all seen uh, that uh, um, they, they do support each other and uh, they help each other uh, in uh, cracking down on protests. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, uh, it seems to me that um, uh, well, uh, protests in Russia have been um, to a certain extent inspired by um, well, uh, weeks and months of uh, protests in Belarus. So, um, well, uh, with certain reservations, we can uh, say that uh, we have set a kind of examples, a, a kind of example for um, our neighbors. Um, and uh, uh, well, that's it, basically. Oh, absolutely, thank you. I Another question coming up in the chat here. I, I wanted to mention um, Walid Al Hathloul, who uh, I believe is the, the brother of Lujain Al Hathloul, who was our uh, Pen America Pen Barbie honoree a few years ago. Uh, she was a women's she is a women's rights activist and writer imprisoned. 
uh, for her work. Uh, he, I think, is in this chat. And maybe, Karin, uh, I, I want to ask you a bit about Saudi Arabia, because you had mentioned early in our conversation that, in fact, um, the numbers have perhaps gone down in Saudi Arabia. And indeed, Lujain al Hathloul uh, was indeed released from custody uh, earlier this year, a moment for celebration. And yet, uh, not still not a great picture in Saudi Arabia. Can you can you tell us a little more? Yeah, sure. I'll try and weave in and actually some of the other questions in the chat um, also sort of touch on on Lou Jane's case as well. Um, I think there was a question in the chat just sort of going back to the the beginning of her case and some of the others um, about sort of public support for, you know, writers being detained or whether there's a public outcry with white writers being detained and sort of global trends. I think one of the reasons why it's it's very effective for governments to, to brand, you know, dissident writers and thinkers as either sort of terrorists or traitors is a very um, shrewd strategic approach because it then enables um, them to do this without having a lot of public outcry. In Lou Jane's case, you know, there were there were, you know, articles and, and you know, things put up on, on government run media outlets, basically branding her and the other women's rights activists as traitors. And so if you look at like broader Saudi public opinion, they're like, well, these women are traitors, they should be in jail. Um, so that's a very shrewd approach, which which helps to sort of dampen what could be public support for for someone being thrown thrown behind bars. So it is a very shrewd tactic. And then in some cases, it can lead to less public support, or less public outcry about a writer being put in jail than you might think, because they might say, okay, well, this person is a terrorist, or they are a traitor, or they are doing something anti-national, and they deserve to be behind bars. So it is a very shrewd tactic that's been used by a number of governments um, to sort of enable enable this approach towards people who are speaking out or, or trying to push for change. Um, on Lou Jane's case too, I mean, what, and, and this actually ties into your, just the recent question, Stephen, about sort of, um, you know, the a push from either neighboring countries or or other countries that might be speaking out. I mean, I think it's no um, coincidence that there were, you know, there were some people released in, in Saudi Arabia in 2019 and 20, but we saw a huge number of releases of people in our index actually in early 2021. And it was really within a few weeks of the new Biden administration coming in. And many people are tying that to the fact that, you know, basically the US government had been, you know, supporting um, MBS, the crown prince in Saudi and, and his very repressive behavior and turning a blind eye. There was no accountability for Jamal Khashoggi's brutal murder, but also no accountability in terms of the fact that dozens of people are being thrown in jail, um, detained for years without any charge or legal process really, except a sham legal process. Um, and it's great that, you know, these people are now being released. So it's, it's fantastic. I mean, Lujain was released. There were, um, between five and other people who were listed in our index last year were also released. But I will point to the fact that it is, um, it's very conditional. They have travel restrictions, they're facing legal charges. In many cases, they're unable to, um, to speak or write or be in touch with a journalist or make any public commentary, let alone, um, you know, sort of regain their professional life or continue their activism. So, um, you know, on the face of it, it looks good and it, and it is for sure an improvement that they're at home and not sitting in a jail cell in solitary confinement and not being able to see their family, but it's, um, they for sure are not free. And, and we, we and others have to be really, you know, continuing to push the Saudi government and any other government that's engaging in this sort of tactic of a conditional release um, to really push for full freedom for someone, a writer or an intellectual or a journalist or an activist to be able to re regain their, their full freedom. I want to try to get in one more question for all of our panelists. We have about 10 minutes left. Bah Bahram Sintash, I saw you shaking your head yes when Karin was talking about uh, states using terrorism uh, as an excuse for detentions. Similar pattern that we see for, for Uyghur and in Xinjiang. Yes, um, this is very great uh, point and uh, what uh, Karin pointed. Um, China using uh, terrorism, this label to almost all Uyghur intellectuals, scholars, re religious figures. So this is a very great tool for them to label one group of people and um, the, giving them a lifelong sentence and also kill them in the, in the persecution, uh, also jailing them, uh, detain them without any question. Once you labeled as a terrorist, you would be a enemy of the world, not only enemy of the world, you will be a labeled as the enemy of the world. For entire world, they, 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 the anti-terrorism, this, this using 
to crack down a nation, a crack down on a any ethnic groups or political groups, this will be the great tool for them. So almost all Uyghur intellectuals in the in the in the camp, they're labeled as a terrorist. The right. Chinese government uh, write there in statement saying that we the same group of terrorists, not we the same group of Uyghurs, not the same group of intellectuals. When you question them, why you detain those people, they answer you, they are terrorists, they are enemy, they're separatists of the country. So this is very bad. bad. The world has to change this. Politics, the, for example, uh, US politics, they have to change, they have to um, make, make it clear who are terrorists, who are not. So when countries label a group of people as a terrorist, the, the U.S. government has a responsibility to change this. I wonder, and, and Atish Tassir, you might have a response to that as well, but I, I wanted to quickly ask you, one of the things Karin mentioned was about propaganda, um, state organized propaganda, but there's also, I know you're quite familiar with this, the troll army propaganda. Um, I haven't looked at Twitter during our conversation, but I imagine you might already be getting trolled uh, as we speak. I wonder what role the digital environment is also playing in these types of free expression crackdowns. I, I, I'm, I'm working on a piece for the Atlantic at the moment and an editor of mine asked me, they, he said, you know, well, how do we know that there's a connection between uh, Modi and his troll army? And I was like, well, he follows them all on Twitter. <laughs> and the, there was no further questions from the editor, but it, it, it's, it's, it's not, it's, it's absolute. It's a funny irony of our world that the profusion of outlets in which people can speak has led to the homogenizing of opinion rather than like more dissent or more so so it's it's it, it, this business that Baram was talking about and that Karen gestured to of labeling you an anti-national of kind of ruining your reputation or whatever that all of that social media is the amazing engine for that and then it's 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 carried around carried out in a very sort of orchestrated very deliberate way um, and uh, a friend of mine, a writer friend of mine, uh, was saying, he said, you know, in the past, fascists would throw you in jail or take away. And he said, now the first thing they do is they ruin your name, they ruin your reputation. And so in a very short time, like I went from being somebody who was part of Indian intellectual life, as is my mother, who's a journalist, to suddenly within a year or 18 months being an Islamist, being a sort of... Uh, a Pakistani agent, and all of this stuff like is is kind of and 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 it sticks. It sticks. I mean, it's not it's not as if one can then one just it's too, the, the kind of megaphone that you're up again is, is is so powerful that one can't really retaliate. I wonder, uh, Volha Kalatskaya, you know, as a translator, as someone who speaks fluent English, who has contacts well outside of Belarus. I mean, is that used against? protesters in Belarus when you have connections uh, outside of the country, or is that less of a threat? Uh, well, you see, um, well, accusations of uh, terrorism, nationalism, and uh, even Nazism are used uh, inside Belarus, uh, well, uh, uh, to make scapegoats of uh, protesters. Uh, you know, um, it's, uh, well, just one of the traditional steps uh, taken by our uh, propaganda machine. Uh, but uh, uh, it's... Uh, um, it seems to me that it's no longer effective. Uh, people, uh, people have really opened their eyes and, uh, um, well, um, uh, some, uh, well, crucial changes in society have occurred that um, now um, will uh, allow us to be much more critical of what we see. Um, uh, <laughs> if we uh, do watch TV, uh, it helps us uh, to be more critical of what we see and what we hear. Um, uh, so uh, it's, um, uh, but still, I would say that um, uh, such uh, names, such labels are uh, still a threat mainly inside the country. 
Well, uh, I, I don't think anyone um, outside Belarus would believe that uh, peaceful protesters have anything in common with Nazism or uh, that uh, uh, they were really uh, plotting a coup or um, uh, engaging in acts of terror. That, that just sounds ridiculous, uh, doesn't it? Um, so um, that's it. Thank you for that. Well, let me, um, you know, we've just got a few minutes left here. So I'd love to do just a quick whip around a minute or so. And excuse me again for the dogs. Uh, just a quick whip around here uh, of about a minute for each of you um, to really respond to actually a question that Walid Al Hathlul just asked, which is, you know, how can we translate what we're talking about today into action? How can we petition for the release of imprisoned writers and intellectuals around the world? What would, what would you like to see the world to do? And, and maybe Volhai can start with you. What can we all be doing to, to, to support the release of, of people who are unjustly detained in Belarus? Oh, uh, well, um... Uh, first of all, I'd like to express my profound gratitude to each and every one, um, a member of PEN Belarus, PEN America and PEN International, who wrote me letters of support and solidarity, who expressed their concern, urged the court to grant me a fair trial and who still continue to stand by while literary figures and public intellectuals are prosecuted and jailed in Belarus and worldwide um, for expressing their political beliefs and for promoting change. Um, it's just immensely important uh, to, for us to know that we are not left alone even in prison, that we have friends and advocates uh, who empathize with us and support our cause. Um, it would be perhaps a bit uh, too optimistic to expect um, uh, the work that um, PEN America and uh, PEN International do uh, to uh, promote freedom of expression worldwide. Uh, and to promote literature, but uh, these efforts uh, will certainly sooner or later um, uh, bring their um, uh, result, be effective. And uh, um, it seems to me that uh, the 2020 Freedom to Write Index makes a really substantial contribution to promoting freedom of speech and expression uh, worldwide. We just have to be persistent. We just have to uh, go on um, uh, standing by um, people who are in prison um, for their um, criticism of their governments. We just uh, have to um, maybe uh, try to, um, uh, well, uh, bring these issues into the uh, focus of uh, governments worldwide. Uh, we just have to uh, keep going. Bahram Sintash, uh, just a couple minutes here. What, what, what can we all be doing? Uh, as Woha said, um, the reports like this, Penn International, they publish it by Penn International. The new report is more important to raise this case because uh, in my opinion, government's actions is more effective than the, the people around the world. Advocacy works are important, but uh, politics are the decision makers. They could change something. For example, they, they put sanctions on the Chinese, uh, the, uh, the government officials who are responsible for the, this genocide. So I think Pan International could push this more even better, to put more pressure to the, go the governments. Uh, for example, the US government, let them uh, take even further actions to um, stop this genocide and then save those uh, writers, intellectuals in the jails. So I think um, new report could uh, bring more impact and then teach them and their, their situations of Uyghur writers and then other intellectuals around the world. Atish Tasir. Uh, I'd like to see two things happen really. Like I think that India hasn't completely crossed the Rubicon. It's not like a country that's like, 
it's not immune to public opinion. It still cares tremendously what this country, the United States, thinks about it. And two things I would really like to see is to see the Indian diaspora move to petition people in America, like within American government and in, within American advocacy, to be very strong about what they defend in relation to their values and, and to, to what that relationship should look like. Because I feel like India has been given a pass. The other thing I would really like to see is American companies who are so outspoken here about certain values. They've been incredible just now in Georgia to do the same in places like India. Companies like Amazon, like Twitter, like Netflix, they're all caving and creating a sort of separate India example, a separate set of values that they follow there and a separate values that they follow at home. And I think that that would make a huge difference if they didn't give in that easily, if they sort of stood by those things, because it's, it's, it, it's still possible to move the country in, in, a, in a different direction. And, 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 and these companies can often end up facilitating the authoritarian rather than standing up for him. Well, it sounds like we should mobilize the people, governments, and the private sector. Uh, I, I, unfortunately, that's the end of our event. Um, thank you all so much. Our, our deep thanks to our panelists, Karin Deutsch Karlekar here at PEN America, Atish Tasir, Bahram Sintash, and Volha Kalatskaya. Uh, also, our thanks to PEN International, the John Templeton Foundation. You can learn more about all of these cases in the Freedom to Write Index. It's at PEN.org. You can explore our Writers at Risk database. Uh, and and we'll be happy to share more of that information in the chat here. Um, but again, I'm Stephen Fee, and on behalf of PEN America, thanks to all who participated this afternoon. Uh, thanks to our panelists, and thanks to all of you for tuning in. Have a great afternoon.